They were the heroes from the future. Teenagers protecting the universe from those that would sow the seeds of chaos. Each had unique powers and abilities. And though they often had their differences, they came together to save the day as the Legion of Superheroes. Now you can be a part of their adventures and learn the history of the future in the Legion Clubhouse. Matthew, I think we're starting to enter a whole new era for the Legion. Once more unto the breach, my friends. It's a whole new day. It's a new day, but is it a good day? We'll find out what happens when Shooter is gone. Action Comics number 385, The Fallen Starboy, published February 1970. Written by E. Nelson Bridwell, with art by Wynne Mortimer and Jack Abel. Synopsis. Starboy's past comes back to haunt him, and it may mean the end of his Legion career. Action Comics 385. Yep. I don't have a lot to say on. Well, I have one thing that I think is very interesting about 385 and 386, but mostly 385. Okay. So Action 385, and we are well and truly, everyone who's listening regularly, hello future people, Uh, Future Future People, because this is a Legion book, uh, knows that right now Legion is a backup story in Action Comics with the primary story being Adventures of Superman. Right. And for whatever reason, the main stories in the Superman book, Superman's an old guy traveling around and trying to figure out how he's going to spend his retirement. But do you know why? Because Superman's old and no one cares about old people. So let's make it a central part of the book so people feel something for us old geezers. He was sent to the future on a mission, and it turns out that he was set up by someone who not only made it so that he aged when he went into the future, but locked him out from returning to the year 1970. And that person, wearing a purple bedsheet, is our well-known Legion baddie bad bad, the Time Trapper. Oh, okay. So it does make sense to read some of those issues, but my God, I was just like, I don't need... (laughs) This, I think not. this is actually a three-issue arc of Old Man Superman. It is a three-issue arc, and it's and not awful. a terrible... It's awful. Oh, don't be that guy. I mean, it's definitely dated. It's super dated. And also, there's a, a President of the United States reference in here. Oh, and yeah, it's 1970, the, uh, so that President of the United States, I think, is Nixon. Is Nixon. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's okay. Superman is still strong. All his friends, though, dead. Dead for a long time. Superman, we need you to go into the future. And they, I need you to help me find a body, Superman. And they uh, they ran out of black ink, so that's why they had to cover color uh, Superman's hair gray. Right. They, they used all the black ink, uh, darkening out that, that Nixon thing. So, yeah. so you can't tell that it's Dick Nixon. So and let's, you won't have let's actually get to the, uh, the Legion tale in this issue. The Fallen Star Boy. Tales of the Legion of Superheroes featuring Colossal Boy, Saturn Girl, and Star Boy, a trio of early, early Legionnaires dealing with some actual continuity. Yeah, this is what I found really surprising is that someone has set Star Boy up and they're going to try and kill him. And mm-hmm. the amazing thing is this story is nothing but a revenge plot from yes. what, 20 issues ago or something? Adventure number 342, way back in 66, which I think was probably in the first 10 or 12 issues that we covered, uh, the story where Starboy was drummed out of the Legion because he killed Ken's new whore, who used to be Dream Girl's boyfriend. Right. And Dream Girl's boyfriend, Ken's new whore, has a brother. Oh, no, not the identical twin. No, they're not identical because this brother doesn't look anything like Ken's new whore. And also, interestingly, we learn that at this point in the continuity, the planet Naltor, where yes. Ken's and Nora and come the dream, from. The, the dream girls come from. Don't have shared familial surnames because Ken's new whore's brother is named Yark Althu. Now, maybe it came from a different mother. Well, at this or point a different in the father. continuity, Miza Nal, dream girl, has a sister whose name is... And this changes later, but her name is given as Zola Ak. Right, right. I remember that. So I think that at this point, we're supposed to believe, at least in a Nelson Bridwell written issue, that 
uh, Naltorian names don't actually carry like that, or they don't have the family names used like that. So right, right. I do like that little bit of continuity, and I like the fact that this is a callback to something that happened five years earlier. Now, who wrote that comics. issue? Who wrote that issue five years ago? Was that Bridwell? Adventure Comics, Volume One, Number Three, Forty Two: The Legionnaire Who Killed, is written by Edmund Hamilton. Boom! Thank you, Matthew. Uh, pencils by Kurt Swan, inks by Shelley Moldoff. So yeah, sixty six would have still been a Hamilton issue, and you remember Hamilton? Yeah, I remember Hamilton. <laughs> Edmund A. Hamilton <laughs> wrote about the Legion in the future. See, I, I so. Can't do that. Yeah, this this issue starts out with uh, sp 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 space pirates, and then quickly, pirates. then is quickly revealed to be a revenge plot, which I really love the revenge plot twist. And I was like, holy crap, they are really diving back into a time period where Starboy wasn't even part of the Legion of Superheroes, and Dream Girl was not part of the Legion of Superheroes, and they both had to be asked to come back, which again was about twelve issues ago or something like that. It's been a while, and I do like, and this is a very Nelson Bridwell kind of thing to do. I like that focus on the old story, and I like the fact that when we get to the point that Starboy is using his power, Starboy's powers are described usually as, I make things heavier. Mm -hmm. uh, Starboy in this issue is like, oh, you forgot something important about me. I don't make things heavier. I add mass. Right. So the gun that you're trying to shoot me with is actually full of molecules squeezed together and it's heavier because it's massive. And then Nelson goes on to explain through Starboy how mass works with gravity to create weight. And I'm like, it's a flash fact. Oh yeah, no, it is definitely got some science behind it, which I think is very, very cool. And I think this solidifies Starboy's powers far into the future, right? I mean, he's basically yeah. talking about how he can change something to have the mass of a neutron star or make it light uh, as helium that you might find. And he's really talking about the, the science part of his power. So I like the fact that they're trying to solidify this with more uh, true science than eh, I just make things heavier. At this point, he can't make things lighter. Right. That's what light last does. And that, that's always... that's the only reason why those two are on the team together. That's right. You need both of them to make one superpower. It's like if Invisible Kid had a counterpart who could not be invisible. Yeah. And, and well, now that you mention it, he has 26 of those. Yes. So, so the other, the other thing that made this interesting was that in or because Starboy's powers are all about quote unquote weight until he explains it away. Mm -hmm. The villain decides that, Oh, I'm going to have us battle in a weightless atmosphere in, in, in zero G's. And therefore you won't be able to stop me. And it's just like, um, that's it's a good thing he explains it. it because that's not how it works. And I do like that. And I also like the fact that they're in that zero G environment and he throws them at a wall and Starboy is like, nope, I got a flight ring and I'm trained, baby. And he's just like, whoosh. This is probably the best looking Starboy we've seen to date. As far as his actual look or his actual power set. The way that he's drawn, this is definitely a standout Starboy issue, uh, both in terms of what he does and how awesome he is, but also how he looks. Because there's a panel on, I'm going to say, page 9 of the Legion story, which is like page 17 of the overall book, mm -hmm. where he's flying away from the wall and he's got this whoosh kind of going on, and he doesn't look like a Superboy knockoff. He looks like a cool, unique purple and gold hero. And I've always liked purple and gold. So, yeah, this is a really strong issue just as a Starboy show off. But you know what else it has? What? Has a little bit of action. It a has a little bit of, of action. Fighty, I mean, it, it does have a lot of action in here because the team does have to take on these space, 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 space pirates. Uh, they do have to deal with these characters, these villains that are able to counteract their powers, such as uh, anti telepathy helmets. Nice. And have we ever seen those before? I don't think so. Uh, it is brought up there like, well, if these guys know all of our plans, they must be reading our minds tele uh, telepathically. And Saturn Girl's like, no, they don't have anti-telepathy -tele uh, helmets or else I would detect that. And that's not what I'm detecting. And right. they have some things to take care of Colossal Boy by going through downtown and, at rush hour. And he's like, oh, I can't step on these people. They look like ants. <laughs> Uh, you know, and again, it's one of those examples of someone taking those powers and taking them to the logical extreme, the things that would happen if you were really that big. 
you might step on an overpass if you were yeah. colossal poet. Yep. I also think that maybe in my phone book copy, mm -hmm. there's a page, they've got two pages flipped around because at mm -hmm. one point they're getting away and then they're on the ship and they're all contemplating things and, and uh, Saturn girl's like, no, the anti-telepathy helmets would block their powers if they were. And then uh, Saturn boy or uh, star boy is like, oh yeah, these are the things that I would see dream girl doing. And then actually the page before he's like, that's it. Dream girl. So it's, it's actually got things flipped around in my, um, in my phone book copy of this. So oh. that's a weird misprint. Cause I was reading this going, okay, he's suddenly jumped to a conclusion. How does he know? And then the next page I turned it and I was like, oh, these pages are obviously backwards. And I don't know if, and I don't know if that's the way it was in the original. I mean, they're numbered six, five, and six, right? But, but they're presented, backwards. yeah, they're presented backwards, that which is, is I think that's just an error on somebody's part. So, yeah, I think it's a reprint error. And then, of course, at the end, they they take out the bad guys, and the guys like, oh, "I'm sorry," and they're like, "Oh, you're still a space jacker." Which space pilot. I don't even want to know anything about that. Don't don't do that. Don't and do so that they're they're like, "Hey, you are a bad." You are a bad person from Naltor because you didn't <laughs> see the future correctly. And he's like, oh, For I'm, someone I'm so who didn't see the future, you sure screwed up, Yark. And then he's like, I will be shunned by my society forever now. And the I end. have a pointy helmet. The end. Oh, man, those helmets are ugly helmets. They are. They These are, are very ugly. ugly, ugly helmets. They're like, put a, take a bowling ball, cut out a place for your face, and then stick some uh, antennae on the sides yeah. and the top. And there is a big, ugly very, helmet for you. It just very, looks dumb. Speaking it, of helmets. Yes. The Naltorian science police still wear the old school pointy, uh, Bobby helmets made out of balloons that I've missed for so many months. Well, And that's because you know why that is, right? Why is that? It's because the United Federation of planets they have a unique style uh, that everybody who's part of the police are all part of. It's kind of like the um, um, the United Nations, right? The United Nations task force all have to have the same uniforms. The blue helmets. Yeah. So the science police have these same helmets. The thing is, because of budgetary concerns, because so much money is going to the Legion and their Legion headquarters and rebuilding everything, the money to get <laughs> the new uniforms, uh, there's like this, uh, not a bell curve, but there's a there's a log curve. Of the further you are away from Earth, the right. longer it takes you to get the funding to buy your new helmets and get outfitted. And so that's why over at Naltor, which is on the far western edge of the galaxy, <laughs> has the old school stuff and not the new stuff that we see on Earth. Yeah, Stephen just made that up, by the way. Uh, hey, listen, if you're going to make up stuff about uh, whatever happened to the Superboy planet, and they're gonna, I'm going to make up this continuity so it makes sense to people. Right. I've, I've got to be the voice of reason. To be there and let people know if you're looking for a reason, this is why. Right. And also what's going on on this planet that they're on, these ancient uh, Xanthu ruins. There's some like Morlocks and stuff running around on this planet. <laughs> you got to have Morlocks. It's, it's Xanthu. It's scary. It kind of is. And, you know, you're not the only one making stuff up in this issue just to explain away something that's weird. Because in the letters column. Uh -huh. They actually refer to, we talked about this when we talked about Action 381, the hapless hero, the matter eater lad uh, who mm -hmm. lives in a bad side of town story. Mm -hmm. uh, duplicate boy used to be called Ord Quelu. Right. This is where they, yeah, this is, is this the origin of that uh, names don't matter, say in front words, backwards or upside yeah, down? Yeah, this is the point where this one actually is an early version of it where, uh, well, they called him Quaid Orlu, which is it? And he's like, oh, and the other one, uh, Violet just misspoke. Right. So they actually blamed it on an in-character error on the part of the Legionnaire, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very, very fascinating. If you enjoy the show, we would appreciate your support. You can find out more and become a Legion Clubhouse member at patreon.com slash major spoilers. So I mentioned at the beginning of the show that this episode is kind of big because we begin the non-shooter era of the Legion of Superheroes, which, man, didn't seem to last very long, but it had a huge impact in everything going forward. But shooter's gone now. I mean, this yeah. is this is Bridwell uh, going forward for many, well, not many, many issues, but for most of the issues going forward, 
We're yep. going to get Carrie Bates and E. Nelson Bridwell. Yep. And this is interesting because it doesn't seem like it, but it has been uh, three and a half years. Mm. Remember when we talked about Shooter joining the Legion? Shooter yeah, it was, was like 14 year, old, 14 year old. Yep. This book is street dated February of 1970, which Correct. means it was on the stands around Thanksgiving of 1969. Mm-hmm. Jim Shooter graduated high school in May of 69. Oh, okay. So Shooter's so out of they school. should have hired him. They should have hired him full time. They actually did. Really? Sort of. Really? Yeah. That, I find that amazing because of um, of what's his name, who was just like, I got this kid for a song and I'm going to work him like a slave. See? He started, he was working for them. He was doing more work for them. Uh-huh. And then he got a gig over at Marvel across, literally across the street back in the day as an assistant editor. Okay. So by early 1970, Jim Shooter is actually working at Marvel. Oh, as an he's assistant working for editor. the, he's working for the competition. Somebody recognized his talent and said, Hey boy, come over and work for us right out of school. We'll pay you the big bucks. This is going to be the best gig you've ever had. Yeah, not really because he's oh, not no. writing. Oh no. He's, he's an assistant editor. And basically for about three or four years, Jim Shooter went to Marvel and did grunt work. And around 1974, Jim Shooter retired from the comics industry. Gasp. Now here's the thing I will say. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people think that when they graduate from a high school or from a college or get a degree in whatever that they've got or a certificate that they're going to go out and they're going to get the top job. They're going to go walk into a place and say, I'm the greatest. You should hire me to redesign your entire video game system, or you should hire me because I'm going to come in and correct all the mistakes that you're making. And often a lot of graduates are upset because they are given, I don't want to say mailroom stuff, but they are hired to work as assistants. They are hired to yeah. work as uh, assistant to an assistant or whatever it may be. And an the problem is, gig. yeah, and the problem is it's not the company saying, yeah, right, kids, shut up and do what <laughs> we say. Although sometimes it is that, but oftentimes it's, we want to start you in this position as an assistant editor because we want to show you, you've been on the writing side and you've been phoning things. I mean, not literally phoning things in, but you right, have been but, sending stuff to us from, you know, across the country. You've never really been in an office and see how the comic industry really works. Come in and as an assistant, you can see all of these different departments. You can see all the different jobs that an editor does and right. you can start to learn the business of comics. So even though it may not have been what Shooter wanted and i don't know what his desires were at this point if he came in thoughting he was the hot stuff Mm -hmm. and was demanding something better and got an assistant job but from marvel's point of view they were thinking not you know three months ahead not six months ahead they were probably thinking years ahead of this is a kid that we can start grooming into our business so that when the time comes we can move him into like a main editor position or maybe uh, the the chief editorial uh, guy at Marvel. But I guess Jim didn't see it that way, right? I mean, he left in, in 74, he, you said. Yep, in 74, he left. And also, mid-70s, Marvel was a complete mess. Oh, they went through so it's five... kind of like the, the 90s. Yeah, they went through five editors-in-chief in the space of about seven years. But wow. a couple of years after he uh, retired, a Legion fan named Duffy Voland, who's actually okay. a big-name Legion fan... Uh huh. Tracked him down for an interview, and they were like, hey, Jim Shooter, you wrote some really great stuff. What are you doing now? He's like, I'm managing a chicken shack in Philadelphia. Um, I don't know what type of restaurant it was, but Jim had actually, you know, he was managing a store. And Duffy Volan went and interviewed him, and this interview was printed. And then people are like, hey, I remember Shooter. He was pretty good. For some way or another, he ended up back at D.C. in 75 and 76, writing Legion again. So down the line, you know, maybe 15, 20, 35, 50 episodes from now, we're going to be talking shooter again. But here's here's the best part. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Yeah. Writing the Legion in about 75, by mm-hmm. 76, he went back to Marvel as executive editor under the editor-in-chief Archie Goodwin. See? By 78, Jim Shooter was Marvel's editor-in-chief. He's so, 27 years old. So seriously, for those of you that are in position saying, well, I want to work in comics and... Uh, the first job that I want is to write Batman or mm-hmm. Superman or Spider-Man or Spider-Super. And and then the company that you're writing for is like, no, you're not going to ever get to write Batman right out of the gate. And they want you to write like a Booster Gold or a, you know, a backup issue to something. 
It's because they want you to feel how their system operates. They want you to work up through the system. I don't know of anyone except for Brian Michael Bendis, but even Bendis, you know, he went from Marvel to writing a- action comics and Superman over at DC. But if you go back into the archives, Bendis wrote like backup issues stuff. Yeah. You know, Bendis decades, did decades ago, comics for years before yeah. he even got to the big two. Yes. So, so it, they want you to go and do other things. And if you're good, then eventually you could come up to Batman. So I think that's a lesson that in the comics industry, in the video production industry, really in any industry, mm-hmm. don't expect to the day that you graduate from high school or college to walk in and say, uh, I'm I'm here to apply for the executive uh, management job at this McDonald's because I'm totally got ideas to totally change how things are done here because they'll say, yeah, there's the, the there's the fryer over there. Get to work uh, <laughs> because it's you just are not ready for that. And it, it does take time to build up to that. So have a little patience. I know everybody is like eager to just get out there. But I think if everyone takes a little patience and learns from Jim Shooter that yep. they started you in the assistant editor position so that you could be editor in chief, what, a not 10 years later, something like that. Uh, five, eight years, six years yeah, later. five or six years later. Yeah. I think that's a probably a good, a good plan and something to kind of pay attention to. Yeah. And until Joe Quesada, Jim was the longest tenured editor in chief in Marvel comics history. Action comics. Number three eighty six. Zap goes the Legion published March, 1970. Written by E. Nelson Bridwell with art by Wynn Mortimer and Jack Abel. Synopsis. How does the Legion fight a man who can counter every one of their superpowers? 386, more adventures of old man Superman. And I'm old. I'm cranky. Where's my super muslax? Okay, don't even joke about super muslax, sir. That's not funny. <laughs> uh, but interesting. Oh, hit a little too close to home. Shut up. <laughs> we talked about Time Trapper last issue, or last uh, first half of this episode. Right. We talked about Time Trapper. Right. This issue shows me something that I've never seen before. The Time Trapper's face? No. Time Trapper normally is a man in a hooded hood. Right. Right. This Time Trapper is wearing this cowled assemblage that looks for all the world like Archie Comics Fox around mm-hmm. 2017 mm-hmm. with big floppy ears. Yes. It looks it's weird. The, and it, it's already a man in a purple bedsheet. And Superman is not merely old. He's on a planet of old heroes. And like, he's on a retirement <laughs> planet. I used to be Electro Man and I used to be Green Lantern. Yeah, that, that Time Trapper outfit is just disgustingly horrible. Uh is he supposed to be, I don't know, he's like, I remember Batman, I'm going to model my stuff after him. But yeah, old man planet, just pass. <laughs> but, backup story, Tales of the Legion backup of Superheroes. Backup story, Tales of the Legion of Superheroes. Oh boy, this is going to be fascinating, this is going to be exciting. This yeah. is going to feature criminals, again, as we talked about in the previous issue, this is going to feature criminals that longtime readers of this series will recognize, and we also see how the penal system deals with uh, problem criminals or career criminals or these, what is, what's the, uh, not psychotic Recidivist. criminals. No, what's the one where it's like, you're a, not a career criminal, but you have a mental thing that compels you to compulsive. Criminal? Maybe it's a compulsive criminal, right? Okay. So we see that, uh, these characters are put into something called the, uh, the prism chamber and these prisms dance around your head and they hypnotize you into removing all of your evil intentions so that you criminal will never, purpose. You will never have criminal urges again. And the first thing that I thought of when I saw these crystals whizzing around this uh, big brute's uh, face is that, you know, Doc Savage had a way of dealing with the criminal mind. (laughs) And that was to stick a big knitting needle right up into your nose and swirl it around a little bit. This is Doc Savage. He had special knitting needles made. And if people are, are thinking that I'm being joking and facetious here, I am not. Doc Savage, who was a a golden age pulp hero, Mm -hmm. he would take these criminals that he didn't think could be reformed uh, easily through regular jail time. And he would send them to the doc Savage Institute in upstate New York. And there they would go under, and I'm not, I'm going to paraphrase here, a medical procedure that cut off the portion of their brain that caused them to do criminal things. And years later, it's basically revealed that doc Savage was performing lobotomies Mm -hmm. on criminals so that they would be dull, be 
calm down so they wouldn't have those urges or have that criminal intent, essentially lobotomizing people. No, li- literally lobotomizing people. Yep. And that was seen as OK. And when you learn that about Doc Savage, I at, and I learned this probably about because I only started reading Doc Savage in the early 80s. Uh, probably it took me till about freshman in college before I was like, wait a minute. And then some people were starting to write more about Doc Savage. And we realized, oh, no, this is lobotomy. This is he was not a good person, Doc Savage. No. And I kind of have a feeling that if you're going to try to hypnotize people or remove the criminal intent from people. Right. Or make them not habitual criminals, that somehow somebody's going to figure out, out a way to get around that. And it's going to backfire on your butts big time. And that actually does happen in this issue because a criminal named Uli Algor put a pin in that. That's Lily important. Al Gore, huh? That name sounds f- sounds familiar. Oh yeah, Uli, Uli. Al Gore. That sound that Uli. name sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, she. Uh, basically you may remember her from uh, such episodes as Action Three Seventy Nine, <laughs> just a few issues ago, like uh, less than ten issues ago. Yep. And the fascinating part about that is that in this issue, she finds a way or found a way before she even got into prison to inoculate herself from all light based forms of hypnotism. Right. That's the way her powers work is that she uh, light doesn't affect her. She's immunized against all light powers. So these yeah. prisms are not affecting her. So she sits in the chair. She sees the criminal go in ahead of her and the guy's like, oh, I'm sorry. I will never commit a crime again. And they're like, okay, good day. Here's 20 bucks and a a bus fare. And she's like, oh, all I have to do is act like this guy and, you know, denounce my past criminal activities. And they're just going to let me walk. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. And as soon as she gets out of prison, she uh, doesn't even go and see a movie. She doesn't even go and check in with her parole officer. Nope. She puts on pink uh, leather or maybe it's pleather in the future. No, it's leather. She puts on a, a pink pleather outfit. Vegan leather. <laughs> vegan leather. And she goes and tracks down the three founding members of the Legion of Superheroes. So we've got Cosmic Boy, Lightning mm-hmm. Lad, and Saturn Girl, and Night Girl. Don't and Night Girl. The only, way, the only thing is, it feels really weird because it's like, here you've got three of the most important characters in the Legion of Superheroes. And you have Night Girl. But then you have to think, she's in, totally in love with Cosmic Boy. So at this point, yes. are they having a relationship at this point? Yes, we are deep in the love story episodes of the Legion. And Night Girl is here solely because of her long-term crush on Cosmic Boy and their developing relationship. The next time we see them uh, is actually during the Mike Grell super naked period of the Legion. So it yeah. seems like they like each other more than they do. But yes, Night Girl is here solely because she's dating Cosmic Boy. And Nelson Bridwell remembers a story where that totally happened months and months and months ago, y'all. Yeah. So Uli. Uli. Whose new crime is vandalism. <laughs> With her push button belt. She has the power to counteract or essentially counteract everyone's uh, superpowers. Yes. So she gives Saturn girl, these horrific mental horrors. Yep. Uh, night girl uh, flips down an alley and says, I'm going to hide in the dark and become the most powerful person in the universe. And then Uli is like, uh, 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 and blinds her with a big flash of light. Lightning lad has been drained of his energy or something. And they have to put him in a, in a, in a glass coffin. His brain has been short circuited or something. And then Cosmic Boy had every bone in his body broken. And so he's he's put in a, bo- a full body cast. Yep. Repelled by his own magnetic powers. But it's okay. It's the future. He'll be good in a couple of days. And so they have to go and track down Uli. And in fact, she's like, hey, I'm going to challenge all you legionnaires. I can take you all down at once. And Brainiac's like, okay, fine. Let's meet. Let's go to the uh, to the junk planet, which yep, I'm guessing asteroid- is. Alice. Yes, I, I'm sure that this one has shown up a million times from here on out. Sort of. Um, this is its only appearance in the pre-crisis Legion. But see, see what during, I mean? During the Volume 4 Legion, the uh, five-year gap Legion, Talus and the wrecked ships specifically, the big uh, tangle of wrecked ships, mm-hmm. becomes the Legion of Superheroes headquarters. So here's an interesting thing that you mentioned this. Now, in the previous special episode where we were talking about um, Brian Michael Bendis doing the Legion of Superheroes in the Millennium event. If you mm-hmm. if you ha- listeners have tracked down some of the art for that, the main page for this event, the Millennium event, features someone standing 
in what looks like the wreckage of hundreds of thousands of ships. So I'm Tell wondering us. if maybe that shot isn't of Telus and we aren't looking at a five year later type legion, a little bit older, still yeah. a little disgruntled, but it wouldn't surprise me if that is the location that we find the legion on in the future. That legion story is about 30 years old, mm -hmm. which means that it's perfectly aged for someone like Bendis to have read it you know, like we did in high school and college mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and maybe bring it all back. So no matter what the Legion brings at her, I mean, Phantom Girl tries to go and take down down Uli and she's just like, nope, sorry, I'm going to deflate you. And Brainiac 5 he can't do anything to bring her down. And so <laughs> Ultra Boy is like, oh, I'm coming to get you. And she's like, doesn't matter. You can only use one power at a time. And that's time enough for me to take you out. And she's ready. And what does Ultra Boy do? Boxer in the face. You didn't expect that power, did you, woman? Never, ever bring a knife to a gunfight. But more importantly, preparing for any superpower is problematic when the guy you're fighting is known for not using his powers. Ultra Boy can only use one at a time, and so he's used to making do without being invulnerable, without being super strong, without being super speedy. He I just was clocks her in the face. I was always taught never to hit a lady, but you're not exactly a lady anyway. Pow! Oh man, that's a horrible <laughs> message, right? I mean, that is Joe's, just like Joe's from Rimbor, though. Rimbor is like is the uh, <laughs> Rimbor is like the Las Vegas, the bad side of Las Vegas <laughs> of the galaxy. Rimbor is like I I don't know. I was like, okay, this is a great thing, right? He's not using his powers. He's thinking of a different way to do it, but then to just. Say it again, and I'll backhand you again kind of attitude. And I'm just like, holy crap, Ultra Boy, that's that's really um, somewhat troubling. It, Rimbor is like the South Bronx of the galaxy. Rimbor is like the the just outside of Oklahoma City. Rimbor, for those of you in Europe, Rimbor is like the punching you out in Liechtenstein. I don't know if they do that, but I like saying Liechtenstein. Yeah, it's it was... Um... Pretty shocking. And it is pretty shocking. No, I mean, you do not it expect it. It works. And it's not like, I think, hmm, I think that there was probably a better way you could have drawn that, but this is like full on, the punch has been finished. Yeah, he's Uli's crossed, head. I mean, it is a big right cross and she's going down. Oh yeah, her neck is snapped back and she is off of her feet flying back and you can tell she's definitely knocked out and it is just like, oh my God, that is like. Some major, I mean, it's a fight. She's a villain. I understand that. It's the times, but smack a lady. Okay. Well, it's the future. Remember, all people are equal, including women who have push button belts. Sure. And, you know, from a, even if you look at this in a 60s perspective, the, the page previous, Joe's fiance got zapped with her zappy kablamicus. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, this girl kind of earned her punch in the face. I mean, I'm not saying it's not deserved. Oh, I'm no. just saying it is super shocking. And, and I do. Like I mean, you do see they... even today, you do see characters. A Clint Eastwood is probably a good example of what's going on here with yeah. Ultra Boy, uh, especially if you have seen the gauntlet, especially if you mm -hmm. have seen uh, probably the gauntlet is the best example because he is going to track down essentially a woman who has skipped out, not skipped out on bail, but she's missing and she has to get to the courthouse uh, in order to testify against these horrible people. And He's not above punching a woman, uh, Clint Eastwood, in some of these movies. And I'm not saying Clint Eastwood is a real person. I'm saying uh, Clint Eastwood as a character uh, in Callahan movies. Or whoever yeah, playing. yeah, whoever he is is not above punching a woman. And it feels like Ultra Boy is is uh, personifying that late '60s, early '70s uh, male attitude towards women who had it coming to him. Well, they do set it up well early in the story with the Legionnaires watching some sort of weird documentary about the, the 20th century mm -hmm. and seeing a 1910 fist fight and commenting about, oh, boxing was outlawed centuries ago. Oh, this is so terrible. Let's watch intently. It's terribly entertaining. And I'm just like, okay. But it's at, what they're watching is an actual boxing match from right. 1910. Which I find fascinating as well because they're watching it live from 1910. They're the not 3D time scope. Yeah, baby. they're not they're not watching, you know, an old film footage. They've actually there's some technology that has traveled back into the past so people can go to this 3D time scope show 
and watch something as it's happening on July 4th, 1910. Yep. Which is that is uh, kind of terrifying. That is super weird. Also, I think isn't Midway City mentioned in this? Isn't that where one of the um um something is going on in Midway City? I could have swore that this is the issue that mentions that. Maybe it's the previous issue. Uh but I know Midway City got a name drop here and I kept thinking, "Oh, they're going to the junk planet. It's it's uh, Detroit in the future. And I was like, oh, no, this is they mentioned right out uh, Midway City, which is interesting because who do we know from Midway City? Hawkman. Hawkman, the the Thanagarian. And if I'm not mistaken, in the future now, not the future of this comic book, mm-hmm. but the future version of the Legion, has the Ran Thanagar war ceased by the time uh, the Legion is around? Or is that something that's still brewing in the background like it is in every uh, continuity of of the DC universe. I don't recall the Ranthanagar War coming up in Legion, except maybe around the time of Infinite Crisis. Mm, okay, when they were doing all of the crossovers in 2005, and I think that version of the Legion would have still been Wade Kitson, mm-hmm. the the V3 Legion, the Earth Prime Legion, for lack of a better explanation. Sure. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I just find that fascinating that they would make a reference to another place that is not, you know, Metropolis, which is, right. you know, as we've talked about before, overtaken everything from the East Coast to the Mississippi. And this issue is actually fascinating because um, I did not realize this until I started putting two and two together. You did mention that we've seen Uli before, but did yes. you know the story of why and how we've seen Uli before? Um, it is explained in the issue. Um, sort of, yeah, they say that we've Uli plotted to steal secrets from the Legion and was being freed after several months in jail. Yes. But the, when we previously saw a character in action 379, do you remember the girl who pretended to be shadow lass? Right. Yes. This is her. That, that girl was never named. Right. This girl has red hair. That girl was blonde, but 20 years later in an issue of who's who in the Legion, somebody stitched these two stories together. And this is the best part. She's been in jail for six months, six months before this issue Mm -hmm. would have been just about that shadow last fake appearance where we find out that Uli actually infiltrated the Legion with sunburst. Right. Right. Like three episodes ago in this show, go back and check it out. You remember me saying sunburst is very natty. So I love the fact that, this story alludes to something that I'm not sure was intended, but it fits into the continuity so perfectly that everybody just decided, okay, we're going to go with that. Yeah. I seem to, for whatever reason, when I read this issue, I kind of knew which group they they were talking about mm-hmm. and what issue they were talking about. Uh, so maybe this never is, explicitly yeah, they never explicitly it said it. And I think that, we don't see occasionally we will see some editor's notes in here like, oh, see previous issue. But I'm thinking that we are starting to approach a time where editors boxes of C issue uh, Action Comics 346 or whatever it is. Needing to start to appear to maybe clear up some of the continuity questions or to let the readers know, hey, we're do, we're following continuity, kids. Isn't this great? Shouldn't you uh, be paying attention to? Because uh, I think that that will help solidify what. DC is doing with the Legion at this point. So I'm all down for that. Well, that wraps it up for another installment of the Legion Clubhouse. Matthew, what did we learn this week? We learned that issues of the Legion of Superheroes printed about 700,000 copies, sold about 375,000 copies, and were still only a middle sales book for DC in the 1970s. A revenge plot is always good. That's true. And once again, it's time for a leadership contest in the letters page. I'm voting Matter Eater Lad to tell us your votes at Majorspoilers.com. I'm voting Never Punch a Woman. That wraps it up for this installment of the Legion Clubhouse. Thank you so much for downloading and checking us out. If you have questions, podcast at Majorspoilers.com. Join us in our Discord server, and you can uh, hang out with other fellow Legion Clubhouse fans, and we can talk all about the Legion and things that are going on. And... Be on the lookout for our special episode for the new Brian Michael Bendis uh, series coming out soon in September. We will have that for you. If you would like to support this channel and make sure that we continue to uh, release new episodes all the way through September, help us out by heading to patreon.com slash major spoilers. That wraps it up for this time. And until next time, I'm 
Old man Superman is dumb, boy. And I'm, he was a skater boy. She said, see you later, boy. The Legion Clubhouse is a production of Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC, and is produced by Steven Schleicher. Your hosts were Matthew Peterson and Steven Schleicher. You can follow Matthew at Mighty King Cobra and Steven at Major Spoilers. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at Legion Clubhouse. If you have questions or comments, send them to podcast at Majorspoilers.com. I'm Jason Inman. Until next time, eat it, Grandpa. This podcast is copyright 2019 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.